members earlier, and they really like your fair tax proposal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the simple version of the fair tax is that you replace the tax that we have on productivity, which means you don't tax uh, income, corporate or individual, you don't tax <coughs> dividends, capital gains, savings, uh, inheritance. Everything moves to a consumption tax. So the only time you pay a tax is a visible, uh, totally transparent tax at the point of consumption at a retail level for new items. The reason that it's more effective, by the way, the fair tax uh, was designed by some of the leading economists of the country from Harvard, Boston University, MIT, Stanford. It was a commission study with some of uh, the top economists, and they were asked, if you could design a tax system that really would revitalize the economy, what would it look like? And so they came back, and everyone thought they would be looking at a, at a pure flat tax, flat income tax. When they came back, they said, well, it's flat, but it needs to be based on consumption, not productivity. Because if you think about it, it's counterintuitive to a strong economy to penalize the productivity that actually creates economic growth. And so they said, if you're going to tax things, tax it at consumption, not at, the, not at, uh, at its production. And uh, that's the heart of it. There's some really, I think, powerful provisions. One is the prebate provision, which means that you uh, give people back before uh, they even spend their money uh, the amount of the consumption tax up uh, to the point of poverty. It's not just for people under poverty, it's for everybody. And what that does, it untaxes our basic necessities. This is the one part of the, the uh, fair tax a lot of people haven't fully comprehended, and therefore they say, but the consumption tax would be regressive. It actually is progressive. And fairtax.org, the website uh, of the group that uh, really designed it, will give you a lot more insight and answer some of the specific questions. But people at the bottom third of the economy are empowered the most by the enactment of the fair tax. Everybody benefits, whether you're the top income earner in the country or the lowest, but the people who benefit the most are actually the people in the bottom third. You've questioned um, Romney's ability to handle the uh, federal treasury. Um, what about John McCain, looking at how he um, ran his campaign? What about how John McCain ran his campaign financially? Would you, if he had to borrow money to keep on going, um, do you think that reflects on how he might manage the uh, nation's economy? Well, I mean, he's been a part of a Congress that has borrowed a whole lot of money, and that's why we have a lot of the debt. Um, but I also think that you know, at least made some concessions and made a lot of cuts in his campaign staff back when things were going tough for him. Um, you know, he doesn't go around bragging that he knows more about uh, running uh, the finances than anybody else either. Are you familiar with uh, Oklahoma's House Valley from the Fort and Immigration Law? And if you are, what's your, what's your view of that? I, I only am vaguely familiar, and I'm not intimately familiar enough that I would feel comfortable in talking about the nuances, but I have not read the bill. Um, you know, I, I read the headlines in the paper that, you know, there was one that had passed, and, uh, but I'm not that familiar with the intricacies. I am familiar with, with our plan of immigration reform. I think it is a, a strong, uh, but also a balanced approach to what I call tough love on the immigration question. It's not that we want to chase people out of here, it's that we want to make sure that when people do come here, they come legal. That's, that's critical. It needs to happen. You said over there that 18 months uh, 18 months of defense. Is that yeah. realistic? Sure it is. You know, the Empire State Building was built in 14 months. The entire Empire State Building. We're not talking about something that complicated. Defense. And it could be built if we wanted to do it. The thing is, we have not had the will to do it. We need the will to do it, I think, to regain the confidence of the American people. If elected, how would you manage the war on terrorism? I'd make sure that we sat down first and foremost with the uh, various countries of that region who pledged billions of dollars to help finance it, whose uh, uh, pledges haven't turned into payments yet. There was a very fascinating article, I think it was either yesterday or Wednesday's front page of the USA Today, and it showed a list of all of the countries. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Kuwait, the countries that had pledged, how many billions they had pledged toward the effort, and the pitiful level of payment that they have made toward those pledges. It's, it's absolutely inexcusable, and it means that American taxpayers are paying the full freight. Uh, I do support the surge. I think what General Petraeus is doing is working. Tactically, it's helping us to uh, get to the place where we are going to be able to leave Iraq and to, to leave a stable and secure situation that we wouldn't have been able to do had we left when the Democrats wanted us to. Uh, at the, the Reagan Library debate the other night, uh, Senator McCain refused to answer directly a question that was posed to him about 
whether he would support McCain Kennedy again uh, kind of stepped around it. Yeah. Uh, you signed a, a, a no amnesty uh, pledge in South Carolina. To my knowledge, neither of the other two have. Would you be encouraging them to do so? Sure. I did when I signed it. I think that it kind of shows a separation between me and uh, Romney and McCain. That, uh, you know, I've been very adamant about that we shouldn't have an amnesty provision. You know, one of the provisions of the McCain uh, Kennedy Act was that you could pay a fine of $5,000 and essentially be forgiven of your back taxes. When I heard that, I said, man, give me that deal. I, I'll pay you $5,000 right now if you let me go from the past three years. Most Americans would come way out on that thing. And it's that, that kind of absurdity that just made people so angry. And we've got to fix this situation, not to, uh, to try to stomp on people who want to come here, but to make it so it's, it's the same rules that we're all having to play by. Governor Huckabee, uh, Senator Santorum, someone who's uh, almost revered in certain conservative circles, endorsed Governor Romney today. Yesterday, uh, Sean Hannity, who is a, um, you know, obviously, full disclosure works for yeah. the network, but is also someone who's a conservative uh, radio talk show host who a lot of conservatives listen to, also said he was going to come out and vote for Governor Romney. Mm -hmm. Sir, why do these conservative uh, leaders almost, why are they why are they going to Governor Romney's camp and, and not yours and not Senator McCain's? Some suggest that uh, the fact that Bank Capital owns a major stake in Clear Channel that is on uh, Sean's network, that maybe there's a correlation. I don't know. Uh, I can tell you this much, that Duncan Hunter is probably as conservative, if not the single most conservative person that I'm familiar with who actually ran for the presidency who understands the issues and who understands the other candidates better than the people who observe from a distance and read campaign material, Duncan Hunter endorsed me. And nobody questions Duncan Hunter's authenticity as a conservative. Um, you know, people can choose who they want to. They do it for various reasons. And, you know, I can't answer why. Um, but I'll tell you whose endorsement matters to me most, and that's the endorsement of folks like we saw in that rally today. And these aren't people who just sort of mildly from their armchair say, no, I think I'll go with Huckabee. These are people who drive trucks for a living, and uh, they you know, raise kids, and they homeschool their kids, and they do a lot of things to make great sacrifices for their families. And uh, you know, there's a fervor with them. And I'll take their, uh, their energy and their fervor and their commitment, because you know none of them are looking for an appointment to a federal uh, agency. None of them are looking to be an ambassador. There's none of those folks out there trying to say, hey, I want to make sure I'm on the White House uh, Christmas party list. These are people who just love their country, and they've got nothing uh, for themselves in, in mind. They have something for their kids in mind. I have one more question. Governor, how can you make the fair tax politically viable? The same way you make anything politically viable. When Congress understands that if they don't pass that, the people are going to fire them and hire people who will, it's amazing how they get the message. The, the McCain uh, Kennedy uh, immigration bill was flying through the Senate until the people of America started melting the Senate phone lines and saying, nope, it's not going to work. And suddenly everybody started remembering who they worked for. And the same thing has to happen. When I was governor in Arkansas, I inherited the legislature that was 90 percent uh, Democrat. It wasn't like those guys walking into the Capitol every day saying, let's see how we can make this Republican government look good. Uh, what I understood from the beginning, I had to sell it to the people and ask them to in turn sell it to their legislature. If we're going to change Social Security, if we're going to go to a system like the fair tax, if we're going to become energy independent in 10 years, you may have a, an initial reluctance from Congress. But when the people of America unite and say, this is what we want to see happen, this is why we elected you guys, then I think that's uh, the tipping point on how you get things done. Thank you, Thank Gary, you. very much for coming today. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs>